All right. So we just had a little break and we are now back. So let's um, think, uh, yes, Senator Clarkson. So Madam Chair, of all the people that are proposed to be on the task force, the one person we didn't hear from is the Commissioner of Human uh, Relations, HR. Resources, Beth, but yes. Sorry, right, uh, Beth Festigi, who's been patiently with us here. And I just was curious if you wanted to hear from her before we launched into our conversation. We can hear from her if you would like. I, okay, thank you. Hello. Government Operations Committee. It's uh, Beth Fastigy, Commissioner of Human Resources, and um, I am happy to participate on the task force. Um, it's obviously an extremely important issue to me and the administration, and um, we need to address the unfunded liability and the structural issues in the pensions. So i um, happy to do whatever the committee and the legislature um, wants us to as far as um, moving forward. Um, I the only, um, I actually had two comments. One would be that I thought the timeline was pretty aggressive. And, um, you know, I would just suggest that the legislature looks at what they want when and then kind of look backwards to what the, um, what you expect the task force to do. And then the other thing, I just didn't quite understand the, some of the language in the task force and that could potentially change anyway, but it just was upon designation and approval any members appointed to subdivisions uh, 1D and 1E of this subsection, which was actually would have been uh, myself and the Commissioner of Financial Regulation, and says, shall be the only representative of the designator to participate in the task force proceedings. So I didn't really quite understand what that meant. It's um, section 10 on yep. page 22. I just didn't know if that means, do I designate someone or do I not, you know, I, I, I just didn't really understand the point, the purpose of that. And as long as someone explains to me what that means, we'll try to comply with whatever it is. <laughs> I, I um, had similar question. And I think that um, it was answered by that you can't, you will designate a person to be on there. And then the next meeting, it isn't a different person. And then the next meeting, a different person. Right. There's, you designate one person to be on the committee. And that's the person that's there. And it doesn't mean that other people from your office wouldn't be called on for testimony and stuff, but there's one person designated. And these are open meetings, right? It's yeah. not a, it's a open meeting so that we would have the ability to look at that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, you know, it's it's kind of important, especially if it's a um, really fast time frame that, um, you know, a lot of my folks haven't really had any vacation or I haven't had any vacation and somebody might wanna take some time off this summer. Yeah, but it does mean that the same person should be representing your those offices throughout the and whole process. If I pick a person rather than myself, does that mean that I am no longer representing or could it be that person or my designee? If you pick somebody as your designee, that's the person who would participate. Yeah. That's Thanks. the way I read this. Yes, Senator Rahm. I would, I would imagine informally, if it's a meeting where there aren't critical votes, someone could miss it and catch up and not be sort of endangering the, the group. They just, they, someone filling in for them couldn't vote. Is that right? Yeah, I think that, I, I don't even know why that needs to be in there because usually when you right. designate somebody to be on a committee, that's the person that's on the committee. And if, if um, for one of the, uh, if Beth gets the flu and she's the person on there, then somebody else can sit in and there are probably won't be many times when there's crucial votes, but I, I don't even know why that has to be in there. But I, I, I think actually it's important to be there because I think you don't want a different person at every meeting. I think obviously a sickness or a reason you're not there is one thing and one meeting. But I think it's very important for this intense conversation to have consistency and have the same person representing that department or that yeah. whatever. And right. Is that language there for everybody or just those? No, two? it isn't. And that's the, the issue. It should, if it's going to say it, it should say that whoever the appointees are from the appointing body, that should be the, those should be the people on the task force. But it only relates to the 
to DHR, DFR, and the treasurer's office. That's because generally, as a legislator, you're appointed to a person. There is no designee. We don't, I mean, the, the it's really specific to the administration because- It the, isn't specific to the administration because it should also be specific to the unions. The unions oh, shouldn't be changing their appointees oh, I every agree. time either. I, I assume they would be named people. <laughs> That was the only thing I was just, I just was a little yeah. confused. So I just yeah. thought that, um, yeah. I just was hoping that someone would explain that if, you know, if ultimately I end up being on the task force and I choose a designee rather than myself, that um, I would want to understand that. <laughs> yes. I think it's whoever you choose, whether it's you or a designee, but don't choose a designee, a different designee for every meeting. Is, and we can check that out, but we can also change it however we want to make it clear. Okay, committee, let's look at timeline. Anthony, I think you had a brilliant suggestion about some kind of an interim report. I thought that um, made a lot of sense. That would be me. <laughs> Senator Collier. I do appreciate it, Senator Polina, but I have I told you that lately. I really do appreciate you, Senator. <laughs> well, we have spent the morning together. Don't forget. We have. Uh, I'd like to suggest that we use Senator Polina's idea, and that some sort of preliminary report is due October fifteenth, and the final report December first. Just shoot, just throwing it out. Allison, what or Senator Clarkson, what what date was the? Um, date for uh, submitting uh, drafts? We we can find out, but it's always the, for the Senate, it's always the first week of December. But I so think that's having the, oh, go ahead, Brian. Well, I'm just looking at the calendar. Um, so December 1st is a Tuesday. Well, we could just ask lunch council. I can just text them right now and find out what okay. it is. Well, and also it may be the deadline for to make a request, not necessarily right. to have the final version of the bill. Right. We just put the request That's in right. right now. I, I just was throwing that out. Yeah. And I okay. thank you. It was yes, we could put the request in in November without having the details. So uh Senator Ram, I think you I saw your hand. Did I? Um I'm I'm good. I was I was oh, okay. Senator Felina. Oh, okay. Senator Clarkson. Well, I, I think that's not a bad idea. I just want to be thoughtful about our house members who do have a, a additional challenges and they're, and we are too uh, with appropriate, with the reapportionment. So um, I, I think this is fine. I, I, I think that the work fills the time available. And so I actually think that Jeff's original idea is one I prefer, which is October 15th. Cause I think my guess is they're going to land sooner than you think. It's not that it's not that uh, huge in scope, but I think I, I would be surprised if they weren't um, very efficient about their time. And so I, 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 I would support Jeff's original proposal of October 15th. So you wouldn't have any interim report then? I don't, I don't, think, I don't think you're gonna need it. I think that this crowd is gonna do, work well and move fast and be efficient. Can I ask a question about that, Senator Clarkson? I mean, if there's an if there's an interim report October 15th, which I actually think that gives more time for legislators to process feedback to it than like a crush of feedback, you know, that we we don't really have an organized way to respond to. I think the the task force getting organized feedback actually helps us in the long run. So it doesn't feel that different to have an interim report on October 15th that then we get feedback earlier and in a more organized way, which, so I, I feel like it's, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And, and this helps us do a better job of that. I, I actually agree. And I, I think that, um, and I do have a lot of respect for what the house is going to have to do when they start doing reapportionment. But I also know that there are 150 members in the house and um they the uh there if we're if we oh, there are only a few um 
House members and Senate members, depending on where we land, who are going to be involved in this. It isn't all 150, and it isn't all 11 people from the GovOps committee. There, there will be some people involved, and the other people can go off and continue to do what they have to do. And we won't have a drafting, we won't have legislation until January anyway. Yep. I, so I'm fine. I'm I'm easy either way, and I think Acacia is right. In a, and Anthony and Brian and you, I mean, it would give you then a chance to do the public hearings afterwards. After you sort of hear what the interim, you know, what the sort of first flush of ideas, you could then do a, a bunch of public hearings, take it around, and 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 have a chance to rework things if they were if it was appropriate. So, so I want to. Um, Beth keeps referring to the committee in 2009 that I was on with Terry McCaig. And I came to a stunning realization at that meeting about retirement, that if you wanted to have retirement, a pension, you had to have had a job that offered you retirement, which I have never had. <laughs> it, it was, all of a sudden I was saying, wait a minute, people are actually getting paid after they stop working, it was a shock to me. <laughs> yep. So, okay. So we'll go with that date. Okay, makeup of the committee. Let's look at that. And Madam I did find, yes, Madam sorry. Chair, may I ask you a question? I'm not sure where you landed. So I, I just, so I'm clear uh, where, where you ended up on the date. July 1st. Uh, July 1st. No, no. <laughs> and, and I know Senator Clarkson uh, liked my idea. And my idea. I had not yet heard Senator Polina's idea, which I'll amend my uh, my, writ my written testimony orally here by saying I, I like Senator Polina's and Senator Collimore's, you know, adjustment. And uh, if, if I'm, you know, I think it's an interim idea and it's a good one. I think that's where we landed, interim October 15th, final December 1st. Thank you. Is that, was that right, committee? Yeah. Sure. Fine by me. Okay. So makeup of the, of the committee. Anybody have thoughts on, <clears throat> I've been playing with numbers, two, legis two legislators, two legislators, uh, so has everybody else been making their little columns here as we've been going along about who is, yes, yeah, Senator Clarkson. Yeah, I had suggested that we move to four legislators. I mean, I like, I like Beth's idea of a lean, mean fighting machine. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind if we just did eight, um, but I, th I think some of the uh, expertise from the uh, administration would be lost. And I, I think if we went to four legislators, two from each body, that would be great with uh, a treasurer, DFR, HR, and then six members of, of the unions. And that would be seven, six. I mean, I you know, that's one more. It, it, otherwise, I think you would have to go to eight. Um, and then that, you know, the, the problem with even numbers is you get tie votes, but I would hope they would function by consensus anyway. Um, Anyway, I, I'm happy to do either four or two legislators, but I think six legislators is a little rich for our blood. I was, I kind of had the same little thing as you. I had two House, two Senate, HR, retirement, and DFR, and then I had three VSEA, three NEA, and one VTA. So it really is oh, one, it, that too. A seven, seven. But that, that might be too big. I, I don't know, that's 14. Uh, that's a lot. It is a lot. Um, any other committee members thoughts? Keisha? I guess just, I, I, I get lost. I, this is where I need a whiteboard. Like I function so much better seeing what we're talking about, but for me, there's two kind of principles that I'm mentally think, you know, noodling. One is that gridlock might not be a bad thing, like an even number of each might actually force a, a challenging conversation to happen, though otherwise I would I would weigh it more toward labor folks as the seven six proposal um, that you just mentioned. But I'm really, I, I don't know if, if this is exactly what Treasurer Pierce said, but it's really hard to get that many people together 
over the summer. And I, I just, that stuck with me as, as, you know, if too many people are missing and then we're trying to do this all in August, you know, and September, I just think less is more and they can hear from more people that way. So that's where I'm at. So you're, you're supportive of eight uh, that the at, that the treasurers suggested for me. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I came around and I'd love maybe to hear the thoughts of others when it's allowed and, you know, not committee members, but other folks in the room, you know, four and four is really interesting. That creates a need to sort of build consensus in a way that might be productive, but nine might make sense from another perspective. So I'm just sort of still mentally trying to figure out what I think about that. Brian, Anthony, and then. Go ahead, Anthony. I'm still fooling with numbers here. Yeah, I think um, I lean towards the smaller number as well. You know, eight would be okay with me. Nine makes sense if you don't want to get a, too many ties, but I don't know about that. I'm trying to visualize what who would actually be when 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 the when Beth was talking about the eight. I think she said one from the VSEA, one from the VTA, that's two, and then two from the NEA was four. So four labor, and then two legislators. And then there would be two members of the administration. Was that the, the No, the I idea? think she said one member appointed by the administration and then the treasurer's office. Okay, that's, I was, that's where I was confused. Right, that's- I mean, that's I could go for something like that. You know, I don't, I don't, it doesn't have to be a quick decision. I mean, we could, I'd like to hear what other people have to say. Yeah. But oh, yeah, yeah. I definitely could go with that or something close to that. Brian? Okay, I'm getting there. <laughs> um, say that one again, Senator Polina, please. It would be one from the VSEA, one from the VTA, two from the NEA. So you got four labor folks, yeah. two legislators, one from each body. One person from the administration, you know, a Susan Young type, and then the treasurer's office. And you'd have to make it clear that the um, the member from the House couldn't be of the same political party as the member from the House. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We knew what you meant. We knew what <laughs> no, you don't. But and the and I think the reasons she suggested one. Just one from VSEA and one from VTA is because they both represent the same um, right. board where NEA is the different uh, board. I mean, in a way, it sounds small to say one from the VSEA. When I say one right. from the VSEA, one from the VTA, it sounds like, oh, my goodness, that's just one person. But it does achieve balance, too. So, I mean, I, that's why I'm open to it. That so I, would, I would agree with that. And I'd add one more on the administration. That would break your. That would give you an uh, an odd number and would be able to uh, break ties. I think if I'm counting, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I was actually just going to say I think maybe you add more one more person from the VSEA because, I mean, I've just heard from so many different VSEA members who have very different jobs. You know, so it right. just like maybe there's five labor folks. So maybe we're just climbing back toward fifteen. But you no, know, that, I hear that will get us to ten. <laughs> Right, I think 10 might make sense. That 10, 10 is what Brian and Keisha, I think we're looking at, which would be then two VSEA, one VTA, two NEA, two legislators, uh, and two administration and one treasurer. And that's 10. And I, I quite honestly don't think you're going to see a lot of uh, ties here. I, I right. don't think this is the kind of an issue where you're going to have all five people over here on this side and all five people over here on this side. And there are so many different issues that need to be addressed that I think people are gonna align differently on different issues. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think 10 is okay. So let's hear from um, Mike, Steve, Jeff, Thomas, who wants to jump in? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll here. go ahead, Steve. Thanks. So I, I, um, I do like the treasurer's proposal. I think um, also the, the, the latest proposal, the 10 um, members would also work. Um, what's really important for us is that the number of members of the three, of the three unions be equal 
to the, the folks who are not members of any one of those three unions. Uh, I, I think there is a lot, a lot to be said for what the treasurer proposed. It might be easier to manage, but 10 is not that much bigger than seven. <clears throat> And in the or 10, eight. they would be, Steve. <laughs> eight, I'm sorry. Eight, 10. That's what we're, we're kind of at eight or yeah. 10. Either way, as long as it's 50 50. We it's would be opposed good. to adding another member of the administration if it threw the, threw the, um, the balance off. Jeff? So I, I uh, hate to be the, the I, I was doing some math here. Um, I was thinking VSEA to, Troopers two, us two, so that'd be six. I was looking at 12, 12. Uh, four from the legislature, two each house, Senate, and two from the governor. I, you know, we've had um, the 2005 commission had 13. Um, it just feels like uh, 12 gives everybody a, a voice and not, you know, so I just thought that getting four from the house and Senate, four from the legislature, two from the governor, and then two each from VSEA, VTA, and, and Vermont NEA gives everybody an opportunity to say they had a, a voice in the process. And I think it's, it, the balance is important, yes, and so is voice, making sure that people feel heard legitimately so. It's a tough, tough balancing act, I know. So you left the treasurer off. Oh, I did. I, um, I don't think that'll work. Yeah, I, my original proposal, just so you know, uh, was added, you know, four members from uh, Vermont EA troopers or the SEA and one from the troopers. Uh, it struck the balance. It didn't include DFR. Um, <coughs> so that's in my proposed language that I, I submitted. That total 18, though, Jeff, I think. Yeah. Yeah, just, that's way, way that's big. That's a huge bus. Yeah, that's too big a bus. Our curves are too tight. We don't even have a table in the state house that will accommodate that many people. <laughs> well, you could, you could eliminate one from the, the governor and give it to the treasurer. I yeah. guess that's the simple way to go. But you still, 12. so you're, you're 12. Four legislator, one governor, one treasurer, and, and two each for VSEA, VTA, and Vermont and EA. I like the five better. The 10. Yeah, the I like, ten. I think I'm landing on 10. Eight or 10 makes me uh, think, I think, and you can bring in everybody. I mean, everybody can be brought in as a, to testify. It's not like the room is closed. The room is open. Okay. Can our, anybody else have any, and I think that what we'll try to do is get this kind of a little bit gelled and then come back to it and um, give us some time to think about it, run it by. Um, I'd like to run this a little bit by our leadership, by the appropriations committee, just to see kind of where, where we're landing. So should we propose 10? I think so. Okay. Sure. All right. <clears throat> so, now we have the um, the administrative support. That was a pretty uh, easy one, I think. To Beth suggested that it be the administrative support come from the um, ledge council, which sure. makes sense to me. Sure. Uh, I, I I think yeah. we hear from ledge council. I mean, they get every one of these study committees. I, know. I, I think. The, uh, the treasurer's all, I think it, it, it would be nice to share a little bit of it. I mean, everybody is under stress. Everybody's workload is heavy. We And um, I would like to hear what Ledge Council says about its capacity. Well, the, the legislators are the least number of people on this, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, the treasurer's actually are the least number, but it's the treasurer's office that oversees all this. So, I, I, I mean, while I'm sympathetic, uh, I also would like to hear what they have to say about their capacity this summer. The, uh, the, one, <clears throat> the one thing that um, uh, makes sense about having it be legislative council is what Beth was talking about earlier is that this is owned 
and um, created and owned by the legislature. We are the ones that are going to ultimately make a decision here, regardless of what comes from this task force, and um, having our our trusted attorneys giving us advice um, makes a lot of sense. I, I I agree, and but I still would love to check with yeah, just we will. their their what their workload is this summer. But I I, I agree. I, thank you for reminding us of that. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm uh, sorry. Do, do we meant where does JFO fit into this? Do we mention JFO or is that yeah. give it a given? No, we mentioned JFO. Okay. We did. No, I think we should. That was the best su suggestion. I thought she said ledge council and J and JFO. I think uh, uh, assistance. It says JFO right here. It says assistance task force shall have administrative, technical, and legislative assistance of the office of the state treasurer, oh, yeah. fiscal assistance from the joint fiscal, yeah. and committee support services from the office of legislative. It should say council, I think, or maybe they now call themselves legislative. Oh, operations is the staff. Staff. And um, so yeah. that would mean, I think Beth would like us to strike A and yeah. include legislative operations and council. <clears throat> so A would be administrative, technical, and legal assistance from the Office of Legislative Council. B would be JFO, and C right. would be operations. Right. Is that what you're suggesting, Beth? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we can help with some of the actuarial work, um, but JFO has some expertise there, and I think that yeah. if we work together, you've got a better result in the long run. Because they, well, again, I, as, as you pointed out, that you folks are the owner and JFO works for you folks. And I think that the, the technical, ex, the expertise is going to come from not just these, the people, if it only comes from the 10 people on this committee, we're doomed. We're in trouble. Yeah. It's going to have to come from other people. But I think that the, the kind of administrative and legal support is uh, different than the t technical, than the expertise on the topic. Agree. Uh, Madam Chair. Yeah. Yes. What we haven't heard anything about, and, and because our appropriations mm -hmm. deadline is looming, uh, we do need to hear uh, from somebody about uh, number two uh, there on line 17 on page 25, which talks about the appropriation of $200,000 in general funds for to support uh, to support this. Uh, uh, that's more than most study committees. And uh, I think we should understand on why we're going to bat for so much money. Well, I think that <clears throat> I don't know that we even need to do that. If it's going to be in the appropriations bill, I think they will deal with it. If we tell them how many meetings there are and how many people there are involved, if there are only two legislators and you're talking about 15 meetings, that's 30 meetings. Right. At approximately hundred dollars a meeting, that isn't that's three thousand dollars, but there will be, and I think that the two hundred thousand was to be able to, as I remember, it was to independent uh, be able to contract with with people who have external expertise that we don't have. So right. it wasn't for us; it was for for right. that purpose. It it it's still quite a bit, but anyway, there we are. Madam Chair, could I speak to that? Yes, please. So I believe, and again, this is from memory, that um, that it was someplace between seventy-five and a hundred thousand um, dollars in two thousand and nine. That included a, some portion for uh, um, a legal consultation. Even though Ledge Council is doing that, you're going to need to run some of this by folks that have some IRS uh, background and some. Um, uh, and actuarial firms do have consultants, not lawyers that will represent you, but consultants. And then the balance of it was um, um, actuarial work. Uh, and that was um, a while back. Uh, when you did some of the work in the, um, uh, for the, um, uh, the house did some of the work when they came up with some scenarios, we did ours, then they did theirs. Um, it was someplace between 40 and 50,000. Um, yeah, so I think it costs, it costs some money. Yeah. Keisha? 
Well, I also think, you know, per Senator Polina's suggestion that this be, you know, shared publicly, there's a little bit of money that would probably be needed to make sure it gets to people, you know, that there's sort of maybe if they have a meeting or two that, you know, they have a little bit of funding for all of the costs associated with publicly sharing the, the draft plan. Okay, yeah. so we're leaving 200,000 in there, great. Yeah. Okay, I think that the, uh, the next, where are we committee? I, I, I think that where we are is we've gotten to the charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I, I have mixed feelings about leaving the, the target in there, the charge on uh, Romanet one and Romanet two, um, <clears throat> because it's so specific. And I wondered if, if, even if it was kind of tipped upside down and you said that the task force will um, look at uh, <clears throat> benefit structures and put that first and then put um, that a potential goal might be this. I, I, I just fear being so prescriptive in the, in the goal. And I, um, so that, but committee, I don't know where, <clears throat> where you are on that. And you're probably more, more <clears throat> expertise at this than I am anyway. So Senator Polina. Yeah. I, I, I have a feeling I don't like it having it there, but I honestly need somebody to tell me in plain English what it says. Okay. <laughs> that might I don't be... like having that kind of target. And this is, it's just ironic because all morning we spent, I, I was advocating for targets in the agriculture committee on another issue. <laughs> um, in this case, I'm not so sure the targets are helpful, but I honestly need somebody to tell me what, what it actually says. So Tom, that's okay. Tom or Beth? Well, um, the boards of trustees, and I think this follows off of their um, um, their their charge. So, um, what they said was that they wanted us to to do recommendations um, that would bring us back to the levels that were uh, the unfunded liability uh, as of the 2021 budget, which was based on the 19 vow. It's, there's a two year kind of process. And uh, given that uh, the senator doesn't want me to go into detail, I will definitely not do that one. Thank you. Yes. I got your message. Um, so I, so go to, um, back to essentially what was in the 21 budget. The difference is um, uh, uh, 200 and uh, excuse me, 400 and I'm going to do this again. My apologies. 604 million, uh, I believe roughly 379 million of that was with the teacher's system. And that leaves um, it's at 225 million on the um, on the uh, on the state side, and to reduce the ADEC back to the 21 level, uh, the uh, from the 22 appropriation, and that is 96.6 million dollar um, increase okay. from the 21 to the 22. That helps. Thank you. And the fear, in some ways, is that if they they fo they'll focus too much. I'm not saying I don't. I'm not saying this is a shared fear, but the idea is that concern is that they might focus too much on that. Or number one, number two, if they achieve that, they might think their job is done without necessarily done doing a whole lot of those things. So, so I, my, my concern about this is very similar to when we set up some kind of a, a study committee or a task force. And we say, <clears throat> but your results, your recommendations have to be revenue neutral. Right. And, and why we say that is way beyond me because the recommendations could come in with a reduced revenue or an increased revenue, but that is more effective in the long run by raising. So it always bothers me when, and I get, think we get bad results when we tell uh, committees that they have to <coughs> be revenue neutral because that might not be the appropriate thing we should amount we should be spending. We should, might be spending more or less. And I feel the same thing here. Is that really the appropriate, is that the best target to shoot for? Or should we be looking at the benefits? And then, I don't know, Senator Clarkson? I think what this is intending to say is, is really reinforcing the sustainability piece. And it is just not sustainable to have the contract, the ADEC, 
eat so much of our general fund and take away from all the other things we're supposed to be funding in state government. I think this is trying to get at a balance that makes more sense for ADEC, you know, an appropriate contribution every year that that isn't so isn't a third of our general fund. So I, I think that's why they're using uh, FY21. I think, and, and we can say it in a different way, but I think that the effort here is to I, to ensure that the target is a, is really sustainable in the general fund and isn't, and we could say maybe isn't more than X percent of the general fund spending, but I think that's what they're trying to get at. And in some ways it would be great to have John Gannon explain some of these because they had very specific notions uh, and it would, I, I'd appreciate his input here on these two sections. I'm going to uh, call on Senator Collimore and then Senator Ron, but I am also going to reflect what I believe it was. Don't remember which one who said it was that neither the treasurer's um, proposal nor the proposal that was originally put out by the House, which was the, their original proposal, met this goal. So if they couldn't meet it, why would we why would we set this as a goal for the task force they didn't meet it in their original proposal that's and yet right they're, that's right who said that yeah. i think it was jeff oh jeff did so senator Collimore. well now i had a point to make but you might have just talked me out of it i guess my position on it is since these are just recommendations and they're asked to find out about certain, I don't think they're mandates. And I guess I'm not as bothered by whether they would spend some time looking at both of those uh, issues as I might be. But you raise a good point, Madam Chair. If, if uh, the other folks haven't been able to do it, maybe, uh, I don't know. I, I'm, not as, I'm not as against leaving it in because again, I think they're just sort of saying, hey, could you take a look at this and figure it out? Kind of no, I think they're saying more than that. It says setting a pension stabilization target number that does these two things. I think they're being more prescriptive than just saying this is one of the things you should be looking at. And this is a potential target. Madam Chair, could I suggest a, a change to that that might work? Yeah. So the change would be approaching that approaches the target. So then if you, you don't necessarily have to hit it, but it gives you some sense of the range getting to uh, Senator Clarkson's issue of sustainability, but at the same, but at the same time recognize, again, we got to 78% of the um, unfunded liability and 88% of the, um, of the mm -hmm. ADEC. Um, and I thought that was pretty good. Now that did not include any revenue, by the way, that included structural changes. So again, if you said approaching, uh, I think that you, you you get the sense of where you're going, um, but also leave yourself um, some room to um, to make that consideration. I'd feel more comfortable with that, I, or even just saying that this is something that looking at this um, and to to making sure that it's sustainable in the long run and being clear about saying that rather than saying, this is the this is the target. It might be, it might be that it's less than that or more than that. And if our if our general fund budget goes up, maybe it's a different amount. I don't know, but I I feel just uncomfortable saying. But are, are we going to ask um, Attorney Wasserman to change the uh, wording once we get through all our discussions? Yeah, yeah. I think that what we'll do is try and have her. Um, Massage figure out that. some kind of word wording to get to there. So that would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. And then and then so, joining us today, I can't remember. No. Okay. I will I'll talk to her afterwards and give her all these. So then let's look at the other um, uh, charges here. And I have to turn on my light. It all of a sudden got really, really dark here. I can't see my paper. I think, it's, I think it's hailing here. Huh? I think it's hailing now. Oh, is here. It? We it had a lot of snow really, this morning and then it kind of turned here. into rain. Now it's hailing. It just started snowing in Rutland. It just got really dark here all of a sudden. Okay. Madam Chair, 
before we move on, and maybe this is related, I just wanted to say something. Yep. Um, I, I just want to underscore why I think it's better to have general language right now, which is, we're, I mean, really, even before we adjourn, we're not quite certain all of the federal parameters around the money we're receiving. We have so many moving targets around what is happening with the federal government that I think we'd be asking them to do something that, frankly, we can't do right now. And it feels like it would really box them in in a way that's qu quite, quite unfair with what we know and don't know about the federal government. Yeah. From everything I've heard from our federal delegation, there will never be money for pensions. There. I, 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 I think that is a hope that is, I don't know where you're getting that hope from. I'm not, I'm not even saying that in that direction, but we also are trying to use, we're trying to redistribute funds for certain purposes and we don't even have certainty around that. It just feels very hard to say, to box us into any numbers when a lot of what we're doing, JFO hasn't been able to come and say, yes, that's perfectly fine in this budget. We do have our appropriations committee has been very clear though about the 150 million. Okay, so that's certain. Well, yeah, it's certain as it can be. Well, it's certain whether it comes out of where it comes from. I think that they've been very clear about the 150 million right now. Anyway, that's what I've heard at all of our meetings with Jane. So, Clark, Senator Clarkson. So, would it make any? Uh, uh, and maybe this puts him in a bad spot, but I don't think so. It would be interesting to have Chris Roop weigh in on these goals. I'd, I'd sort of like to have him, uh, our JFO uh, expert on pensions. I, I, I'd, I'd appreciate his input on these sections and see uh, what he might suggest. All right, we can do that. It still is a policy decision for us. I know, but we he's our he's one of our few resources that we can turn to. I guess I guess what I would what I would hope is that he would be when it specifically asked for uh, help from JFO that he on this task force that he would probably be the person that would be weighing in from the from JFO for with the task force. Yes, he, he's already submitted a fiscal note for this, which is terrific. And I urge us all to to, to look at it. And I, I'm just going to go back to it to see if it actually addresses these sections. Let me find it. Uh, so if anybody doesn't have it, they should. Uh, it is April 15th. Uh, Chris Roop on the JFO website is the fiscal note for this bill. For how, what, what kind of a fiscal note did he put on there? Because we don't know what the benefit package is going to, I mean. It, 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 it's a full fiscal note. I urge us to take a read of it. It's, 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 uh, it's got, it's, it's great. It's fiscal impacts. It's uh, reporting requirements. He and it's it's a summary of what it does basically. And I'm just I'm just looking for it to see if okay. if it mentions the goals. All right. Well, I I don't know if it's the fiscal impact of the bill or the fiscal impact of what the task force is going to come up with because that we can't. He, right, no, it's not what it will come up with. It's what is in the bill. Right. Okay. So I will ask him to weigh in on the goals and see what he has to say. And we should all read the April 15th report. And then are there other charges in here that we feel we need to address besides taking out the one about defined contributions? Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's not a charge, but Destigi brought this up, and I'd just like to suggest that on page 22 that we um, take out lines six, seven, eight, and nine, six, seven, and eight, and just um, as designee and and not worry about 
I don't know where that language came from, and I, I don't I don't understand. Oh. oh, the thing about the designee and participating? Yeah. 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 I think designee is clear enough. I do too. I, I but when people when people are asked, we, we I don't think we've I've never seen this language in any other any other commission or task force that's been set up that says, okay, Beth Fastigi, when you appoint somebody now, she's the, that's the only person. That's assumed that it's going to be that they're not going to change the person every for every meeting. I, I don't understand why I've never seen that in any other any other um, where it says designee. No. Uh, but I have served on task forces where there is a different designee often from the same office. And I think what this is trying to get to, and maybe we want to ask it for everybody who's appointed, except the legislators who are appointed by name, um, maybe we ask it for all the designees that everybody be the one who is consistently serving on the task force. Once designated, you need to serve. I mean, I think, oh, I think yeah. that's what this is trying to get to. And we can, we can, we can, we can say that, but we should make it then for everybody, not just I, I for just, the, I just the governor's that. appointees. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's important. I mean, the legislators are named by person, but the rest are, and I think what this is trying to get to is consistent representation of that office by the same person, which I have been on task forces where they're, it's inconsistent and it's it's not helpful because it means there are too many different ears hearing it. But if you extend it to all the designees, then that would be helpful that the hope would be consistent attendance by the same person. One yeah, other. Fine with that. It just seemed to single those two people out and I couldn't figure out why. I couldn't either. That's why is the consistency of attendance. No, no, no. He means why they uh, just had it apply oh. to those two people instead of if the NEA, if, if the VTA has their one appointment and one time Mike appears and then one time somebody else appears and then Joan appears the next time and then Betty the next time, it should apply to everybody. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay. But I think that's the purpose. Right. Right. Yeah. But they didn't make it apply to everybody. I would then make it apply to everybody who's dead. Yeah. I'm going to, it's a good idea. Brian, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Other uh, charges that we need to um that we should uh look at here at center plena this, this is a little different i mean I, this is something i'm not sure it's in here but i think we should consider putting in because we've heard conversations about the impact that the changes in the pension plan might have on ret retention of the workforce whether it's state employees or teachers um, we've heard that you know mm -hmm. the effects depending on how the system is set up we may find ourselves losing workers, and I think uh, it'd be good to put into into the add into the charge consideration of the impacts of the potential impacts on the workforce. Yep, got it. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, retention and recruitment. Right, retention and recruitment. So this is a pretty minor point, but so uh, I, I realized that I didn't say this before, and I apologize. But if if any of the rest of you who aren't committee members have something to say about what we're talking about, please just raise your hand and, and we'll call on you because we really wanna get, make sure that we're going in the right direction here. So I, I, sorry I didn't say that before. I just figured that you knew how this committee worked and you were free to say something if you wanted to. Although not you, Jeff. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> okay, Jeff. <laughs> Just real quick. So I, you know, to Senator Polina's point, in my written estimate, in my notes and, and amend, proposed amendments, I talk about recruitment, retention. Mm -hmm. it's on, I, didn't, I didn't give it page number. I think it's page two, maybe three. But I, I did talk about that. And I've got specific language. As to the charge earlier about the, the targets, um, you know, certainly I understand where the, where the number comes from. But since nobody else achieved it, I thought, you know, why, why put the task force through a process that just might not be achievable? So take it out, let them establish what they will. Uh, and, that's, and I propose, you know, striking as an II on uh, da, 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 that section. I'm sorry. As an educator, uh, yeah. do you know what those are called? 
Tucker Anderson is the one that, um, those are called Romanettes. Oh, Romanettes, I did not know, I'm sorry. Now you do. I do now, I will forever cement it in my memory. Thank you, Senator. Be fair, Jeff's yes. an attorney, not an educator. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Senator White, Chris Brook just dropped me a note saying that he could join for about five minutes today, or would you like to have him another time? Um, if he can join us for five minutes now, that would be good, and we'll be very pointed about our questions for him. Okay, I will send him an invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Jeff, finish your thought. No, I, I'm, I, I think it's fine. I've, I've, I've made some recommendations, some amendments, and if a lot of it, what you're discussing here, I include, so some language tightening up, I think, and some proposals yeah. to Senator Polina's recruitment and retention. I've got some language there. Proposed. Yeah, I just, I see that. Mm -hmm. So but while he's coming to join us, I'm gonna, um, so based on benefit and funding benchmarks, it says proposed new benefit structures, and I'm gonna cross off new and just say proposed benefit structures. Where, where are you, my dear? Oh, it's just a very simple, I'm looking still at the um, draft because I didn't want to print it out again, <laughs> but it's the two that uh, very specifically have the targets and then there's B and then there's C. Based right, on benefit. Right, got it. I, I just needed to know where you were. Yeah, got and it. I'm just taking out new because no. the, the proposed the benefit structures. Madam Chair, Chris is here. Yep, I see that, thank you. So Chris, here's, here's um, the question that we would like to pose to you. First of all, <laughs> you did, and I apologize, I guess I haven't read it, an April 15th uh, fiscal note on the bill, but not on what the task force might come up with because we don't know that, right? This is just a carrying out this bill. And then if you would comment on uh, there are two targets here in the bill um, that I'm sure you're aware of, and it's okay. And if you would just comment on those. Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the record. Chris Roop, Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, yes, to, to your first question, yes, the fiscal note uh, addressed specifically the, the costs of the bill, uh, meaning the costs of the task force, costs of the, the reporting uh, that, that the bill would codify into statute and uh, you know, the, the $200,000 appropriation to support okay. the work of the task force. It did not weigh in on um, any any proposed solutions because as you correctly pointed out, there are no proposed solutions right now. Um, to, to your second point, you know, this is certainly a, a, a element of, that's more in the, in the policy realm, um, but I, you know, I participated in the House government operations hearings um, when they were having these discussions and you know, the intent here and the context in which this this language was proposed was, you know, the House Government Operations thought there was some value in trying to define the scope of the problem that the, that this task force's work is intended to focus on um, in order to try to make that clear at the outset and not make this a point of, of contention. I don't believe the intent was to, to predetermine an outcome one way or the other or a set of recommendations, but it was to, to try to define the problem and focus on both the ADAC, um, you know, the, the impact of the budget piece of the equation and the, the actuarial accrued liability side of the equation. So you're not just focusing on one or the other, but taking a more holistic view. And uh, as, as Treasurer Pierce noted earlier, um, this is the same type of lens that she applied in her January 15th report. And, uh, you know, I, I think the intent here was to just try to be clear about Focusing on the, the size of the growth we saw from FY21 to FY22 um, and, and not on trying to boil the ocean, if you will, or, or, or try to, to, to have spirited debates or conversations over, over the, the size or scope of the problem. Um, having said that, you know, the language may be able to be worded a little bit more clearly, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to speak out of my role or out of school, but I think the intent here was um, to try to give the, the task force some direction to, to present some recommendations that focus on both sides of the equation that can get you to those dollar figures. It will ultimately be up to the General Assembly to pick and choose from among those recommendations um, what, what they may or may not support ultimately. And, and is it important to, that we actually get to that dollar figure or just to uh, 
something that is sustainable over the long run? I think I think defining sustainable is inherently subjective. Um, and, and you know, I don't know if I don't know if you necessarily have to get to those dollar figures in order to have a material positive impact on the funds. But I, I just speaking from personal experience working on task forces uh, when I worked in Philadelphia, you know, I, I think especially when you're on an aggressive timeline and you have a really difficult issue, the more clarity you can provide at the outset about what the charge of the group is and what sort of the problem, if you will, is, and then say, you know, go focus on providing some solutions that get us toward this problem, the, the smoother path you're likely to have in the process. So I, however the General Assembly wants to define this, you know, I, I, I personally see there's some value in, in trying to define the problem at the outset. Thank you. Wow, that's helpful. Any questions? No, that was helpful. Thank you. And thank you for having been listening enough to be able to just jump in. My pleasure. <laughs> that was great. Doesn't always happen that way. Try to be efficient. Thank you. Okay. Just just for your information here, committee, if if I go away, it's because right now we are in the middle of a huge rain, thunder, lightning, and windstorm. And um it the it looks like the trees are about to fall on my house. So if I go away, just keep on, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So were there other, <coughs> other of the, um, I will ask Becky to work on some language uh, around that with, um, with Chris and Tom and Beth, just to try and get some language that is, Define helps define the problem, but may not be as proscriptive. Is that? Yeah, and I want to say, Chris just said in 25 words what I wanted to say, but it took me five minutes to say. So I, I thank him, but that's exactly what I meant. Yeah, uh, of course you did. <laughs> so other. Um, uh, of the charges as Senator Polina? Yeah, this is partly a question. We've heard um, the labor folks particularly talk about the desire to have a, a, a revenue stream identified. <clears throat> In the bill as drafted, there is this, a, a part that says examining permanent and temporary revenue streams to fund the state employees, et cetera, including, a, that's where it also goes on to say, including a review of whether all or part of retirement income should be tax exempt. But putting that aside, it says, this is on page 24, line um, G, line 10, examining permanent and temporary revenue streams to fund the Vermont State Employees Retirement System and State Teacher Retirement System. Is that adequate? I mean, people have still talked about the need for a revenue stream. I, I, is, what, is that language not adequate? That's, I'm, I'm sort of asking the labor folks if they... Right, because it is there and that's what... I just want to, I don't know if we're yeah. leaving something behind. So, um, yeah, Jeff? I, I, I did not, Senator Pauline, I did not propose any change to that language. So I, I guess to, in answer to your direct question, I think it is adequate, okay. given that the task force, you know, could look at it. Okay. I am going to take out, though, I believe, unless anybody disagrees, including a review of whether all or part of retirement income should be tax exempt, because I don't think that's the the purview of this task force at all, that's a Ways and Means and Finance Committee issue. And are, are, does it imply that you're gonna look at all retirement income in the whole state should be tax exempt? Yeah. Or just for retired teachers and state employees? And that doesn't seem fair. So I'm gonna, unless there's objection, I wanna take that out. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. Okay. Okay, any other? Um... <clears throat> Steve, Mike, Jeff, Beth, Tom. Leave, leave time makes sense, right?
yes. Uh, I, I will speak to that if you don't if you don't mind. I was actually going to include it, and then I saw it. I caught it at the end. I think it's a really good provision to have. We've had some problems uh, getting people released, and I think it's important. It, it's this is an important state issue. We, we've got to make sure that the the people who are on this committee, this task force, excuse me, are allowed to attend. So I think it's important, and I appreciate it's there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, I am really, really, really hoping that when this task force is meeting, that it can do so in person. Because this is less than satisfactory in terms of really getting to issues and talking to people. Um, uh, we had some thing yesterday and um, somebody said, well, maybe you have to have a signal, you know, like maybe Senator Clarkson can give eye contact to the chair. You can't give eye contact on these meetings. I can't. It looks like you're all looking exactly at me, but I know you're not. Madam <laughs> Chair, the, the three labor unions here have been talking in code the entire time. <laughs> I don't doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> So any other things here? And the, 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 remind me again why we particularly uh, pointed out the Department of Corrections employees. I know why we did the, the judge, the judicial, but remind me about that. So Madam See Chair, it? it's um, part of the discussion. You may, you may recall that in the statute currently, there is a carve out um, for uh, correctional officers and for staff at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, also at the Vermont Veterans Home. And um, this, there's also a, pro a proposal uh, for a, a new group called Group G. Um, there is, um, has been a lot of discussion given the recruitment and retention problems in the Department of Corrections and the fact that life expectancy of a corrections officer is only 59 years old that perhaps um, <clears throat> this is an issue that should be examined uh, in the same way that we look at law enforcement and whether they physically uh, can be asked to perform the same level of tasks um, at, age, at age 55 that they could at 20, given the physical nature of their, of their jobs. Um, it also, was also part of the, of the group see uh, study that uh, you were a part of, that Mike was a part of, and, and I think Commissioner Festigi may have, and the treasurer, of course, um, that looked at um, who should be in Group C and, and who shouldn't be. This was mentioned as something that the legislature needed to spend more time uh, evaluating. But is this an appropriate uh, topic for this task force, or is it something that the task force should recommend that be looked into further? Yeah, I, if you're asking me, I would say it's an appropriate issue for this task force uh, to look at be, uh, because of the, um, the impact it would have on, on the unfunded liability um, and the ADEC and, and being part of an overall, uh, if, it, if there was gonna be an opportunity to address it and have, um, uh, there uh, an offsets be proposed to cover it. This would be the vehicle to do it. I see. Okay. So, Senator Clarkson. Sorry, uh, Steve. I, I guess I'm. Well, I get, the, the House had put it in, it, it was, so clearly they felt it ought to be uh, looked at in the course of the study. So, uh, but is the expectation that? Uh, people in corrections, the correction officers would be able to retire at an earlier age and that would just put a further burden on the retirement system? Currently in the current statute, uh, they can retire at 55 without penalty, um, which, is, which is not quite what law enforcement has, what Group C has. Um, and so the, there has been some discussion about whether they should get something better than that, maybe not full retirement, but some in some reason to acknowledge that not everybody can continue um, to do the kind of physical work that a correctional officer at times has to do uh, when they're 55. Um, 
And so, or older. <laughs> and it was particularly pronounced during the public hearing since the, the speaker's proposal was to have people retire at 67, which you can't be, I mean, it's really hard to see how that would work. So Senator Rahm, I'm gonna ask you what your question is, but I'm gonna ask you a question first. Did you had suggested that one of the things that we put in here is the impact that it's going to, that any changes have on, and Jeff has talked about retention, recruitment and retention, and then they talk in here, it also talks about the kind of impact on the whole economy of the state of Vermont. But do we wanna have um, some special emphasis on the impact on um, people of color and women? I mean, if you're asking just just me first, you know, I would say yes. I think what we know is that. Um, oh no 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 no! But a dog. I'm getting attacked by my dog. Excuse me. One <laughs> so so you know what I can say that that I, I have some knowledge in, especially from Change the Story and others, is that women and people with disabilities, and that could be related to old age and retirement, face a disproportionate burden of poverty. And I think what I would also say is we just don't have a lot of good information on people of color in our um, retirement systems or on fixed incomes in the state. So I would say, you know, yes to all of the above. I'm still an advocate for things like disability status, age, gender, and race being disaggregated whenever we can, especially in understanding the needs of our elders, our older Vermonters, so yes, <laughs> if you're if you're asking me, yeah. Well, I just wondered, and if, if we can, on um, I think it's D, <clears throat> just add a sentence there that would address the um, particular impact it might have on uh, any changes might have on women or people with disabilities. Yeah, yeah. I, I think definitely, given the percent of women uh, in the uh, teachers retirement group in particular, and. That, which is huge, right, right. Jeff? It's a it, huge percent, uh, particularly after a certain age. I think okay. it's seventy-seven percent. Yeah, seventy-seven. That, right, seventy-seven percent. Okay. And we know that they, uh, we yes, change the story has been particularly illuminating about about their financial status. If I could just, say, you yeah. know, I know I don't want to. If it's too complicated to collect race and ethnicity information, I understand. I feel like a lot of immigrants and people of color find an entry point into work as educators, as crossing guards, cafeteria staff, bus drivers, you know, we do, you see a disproportionate number of people of color try to work their way in as cultural liaisons or on, you know, lower wage uh, work assignments to sort of help their kids get access to um, the workforce. I, it's it's anecdotal in my mind, but I see it a lot in Chittenden County, and I do think it's worth understanding the entry points that uh, people of color and immigrants have to working in our schools and the impact on them when they retire. And most of them are probably then not in the NEA system, but in the municipal system because they're not uh, teaching staff, so they would be in the municipal system, I think. Madam right. Chair, um, if I yeah. could, we do have gender information. In fact, um, uh, uh, Senator Rahm, I would um, uh, uh, recommend you take a look at two charts that show the disparity in retirement. And uh, it is getting better. Uh, there's a chart with the uh, state system where it was really bad and it's getting getting a little bit, a lot better, but there still is disparity. We do have that data. And uh, the only right. other thing I'd say is a DC plan because women live longer. Um, um, they have a greater risk of running out of dollars in retirement. Right, right, which is what we learn and change the story. Yes. And if I may, they put in less because they typically take time off to have children. Mm. And they probably and earn works. less too. Right. Uh, all, all those above are supported by our analysis, yes. Great. Thank you for that, Beth. Thank you. Okay. We don't seem we don't have a lot of demographic information regarding employees with disabilities at the state of Vermont. I don't know if they do um, um, in the youth system, but it's not something that it's usually something that people would self declare. It's not something that we particularly mm -hmm. track, and so that would be harder to that would be harder to get information on that. I mean, we do we do in the 
resource board anyway, we do work on disability retirement. So we get information in that sense, but the swath of employees or retirees that have disabilities, we really don't, I don't, I don't, I suspect that uh, Treasurer Pierce doesn't have that as well. We, you're correct. We don't have it if someone did not apply for disability. We do have the information in the demographics on, you know, how many years and so on, and and the income related to individuals with disability. I did a demographic report in 2019 on both systems, and it has all this data across by 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 gender, by uh, years of service, by. Um, um, early retirement, no, uh, normal retirement, and again, by gender. And I'd be very happy to uh, forward both of those to the committee. That's uh, uh, great. <clears throat> and I think that we need to, um, as a state, we need to uh, kind of come up with a, a way of collecting, a standardized way of collecting data among all of our agencies and departments and in education and in transportation and in health, um, labor, all of, we need to have some kind of standardized way of collecting data so that we actually know what we're doing and what we're not doing. And um, I've, yes. been, I've been working on something with, um, around that. But anyway, anyway, that's a different topic that, okay. Anything else here? If I work with Becky to get this, um, I'm trying to look at the schedule that we have. Uh, you know, Keisha, you don't know this, but um, my desk in the state house would be perfectly tidy and clean in the morning. And by three o'clock in the afternoon, there were piles everywhere and I didn't know anything. And that's what it looks like right now. So tomorrow, actually, we're looking at OPR because we need to get that finished up. <clears throat> and we're having, looking at the uh, eugen eugenics um, apology resolution. We have some interesting people coming in. <laughs> and then we're going to have a walkthrough of um, 435, which is the DOC. Um, Steve, you, you're interested in that. I know that's the DOC. Um, uh, bill that around polygraphs and drug testing and sexual assault, okay? And then on Friday, we're going to <clears throat> look at this again. And so what I'll try to do is have these changes put into language and get it distributed by tomorrow afternoon so that everybody can have a chance to look at it so that we can, does that make sense? Sure. That would be great. So I'll I'll work with Becky and whoever else needs to. Um, I think uh, Tom, you were going to work with Becky around some language on the VPIC. There were a couple changes on there um, on the qualifications for the chair and some other things. <coughs> we'll try. I submitted, and I submitted, or I gave her a document oh, of good. the chair definition and the requirements that they utilized in 2016. Um, it's pretty extensive. So that's in the VPIC policy. So you have that up on your uh, okay. document page right now. Great, great. Okay, anything else here right now? Oh, I, I think this was good work. Yeah, I think this is good. I think we see what we get in writing and we'll, we'll probably have more ideas when we see what we get from Becky. Yeah, and <laughs> so try and get this out. And then I also will check with Jane and we'll check with the house about what the uh, changes are that they made. Um, and yes. appropriations, house appropriations. Uh, we, we need to find out if they made those changes that Jeff said they were talking about. Well, and, and what, what I think that those changes will be more appropriate to our appropriations committee perhaps than ours, us. But um, anyway, we'll look at that and uh, then I'll, and I'll find out from her. <clears throat> I think they're hoping to vote out the budget on Friday. And her position was that if, <clears throat> that if we get this to them, not to get into the budget bill, but they'll do a floor amendment 
to put it into the budget bill because we simply don't have time to pass it in 499, 449, send it back to the house, have them work on it, send it back. So it'll, I think it'll end up having to be um, worked out in um, conference committee on appropriations bills. That's where I think we are. 